I'll just give you a very brief background because I know we need to catch up. Why am I here? Well, I guess because I've been sailing since I was seven. Uh, grew up sailing somewhere on a lake near Chertsey, which I think is now under the M25. Um, I've been passionate about my sport forever. I've been in, sort of heavily involved in the racing side, got involved with Olympics for a little while, other things, fireballs and all sorts, and a bit of keelboat sailing. And these days I spend more time sort of messing around on a classic boat with my husband, who also does a little bit of sailing from time to time. I'm sure some of you here will have come across him too. But getting people into the sport has been very much a passion of mine for many years. I've been involved with the RYA's Participation and Membership Committee, helped set it up, chaired it for a few years. Um, and then various other projects I've got involved with, the charities and trusteeships. And somehow or other, I got involved with a big project called the Futures Project with British Marine. Just out of interest, who in this room may have seen the seminar we did back in May, the webinar, sorry, back in May, or the presentation at the dinghy show? OK, so some of you will have seen some of what I'm covering today. Um, the report, the Futures Project report, just briefly to give you the background, was British Marine, the trade body for the whole of the marine leisure industry, wanting to understand for their members what might be happening in the next five to ten years, how the industry might want to adapt. So the remit was really to go and look at all the participation research across the whole of boating and water sports, so wider than just sailing, but also to look at the research out there on social behaviour, consumer behaviour, the social trends that might well influence what's going on within our sport for the next five, ten years. So my project was an overlay of the two big pieces of research. Now, don't try to read this slide, but this is just the volume of research work that we looked into, of all the data that we took in to do the analysis work, to come out with the, if you like, the recommendations and the sort of outputs from the report for British Marine, and then feeding them into organisations like the RYA, like British Canoeing. So, big piece of work, took about six months to do. What I hope to do today is we will do a very quick canter through some of the participation trends. There's, there's quite a few slides, so hang on to your seat because I will go through them quite fast. Um, and then we'll have a little chat about some of the social trends that also came out of the report, which I think are the ones that are probably most important for membership organisations like clubs. Um, then the latter part, we'll talk a bit more about some of those challenges that are perhaps being suggested out of, out of this. Um, and then a couple of frameworks just coming from sort of my marketing sort of background, which is what I do for my day job, uh, which might help you to take away at the end of, end of the day. Sorry, I'm squinting slightly. Because of the lights, I can't actually see my notes, so I'm going to have to just run with this a little bit, so bear with me. Um, so participation and participation trends. There's a lot of stats I'm going to run through very quickly. So don't look at the numbers, just look at the trends. This is what's going on in windsurfing in terms of participation, numbers actually doing it. It's the dotted line to, to keep your eye on. Don't worry too much about the solid line. The dotted line is the overall trend. So windsurfing not looking that pretty over the last 16 years of data that we have, but stabilising a bit at the moment towards the end. Now that's a pattern you'll see a little bit emerging over the next few slides. Now this is the age profile. These are the slides that really started to bother me when I was doing the research. Um, the bottom line, the green one that's trending upwards, is the 55 plus age group. The top two lines, the blues and the, the kind of orangey colours, that's 16 to 34s and that middle group 35 to 54, are generally trending downwards. Now you'll look at this and go, oh yeah, look, there's a little bit of an uplift great on the, um, the blue line, so it's good to see with the last few years younger people coming back in. But just hold on to that thought while I talk about a couple of other slides, because this pattern is happening a little bit more. Now this is power boating, motor boating participation. Again, a bit static, not much growth. Motor boating, a little bit of an upturn over recent years. All good, we think. Except when we start to look at the frequency of participation, You'll notice those top two lines, those are people who've been participating between one and five times. Now there's a correlation with that slide before, we saw some upturn, but it's only people that are doing a little bit. The lines along the bottom are your frequent, your six or more times a year, up to 13 or more. So there's an issue here, we've got a lot of casual participation, which is good in some ways, it offers us an opportunity. 
but the pattern keeps emerging. We've got the age graph. Now, you've just seen something like this with windsurfing. That green line at the bottom is trending on upwards, so we're doing well in the 55 pluses. There's more and more of us doing it. The top two lines, again, trending downwards, but again, the correlation between, yep, the blue line, the 16 to 34s is growing, so what have we got growing? A little bit in the younger age group doing it casually. Now, hold that thought till I start talking about some of the social trends. Okay, yachting. I mean, a lot more of us, I'm sure, involved in and aware of the yachting stats. Um, and we covered this in the webinar. Significantly more people go cruising than they go racing. Absolutely, it's about three to one in terms of the numbers. Good to see again in cruising that there's been an uplift in the last two years. Racing much, much flatter, much flatter. Now you're gonna get what I'm gonna say next. Look at the casual line. So cruising, casuals, where's the growth coming from? There's some very distinct correlations in the data that are coming forward. Actually, since I did the report, which was a year and a half ago, this has got this year's data overlaid in. So there's some things going on that we need to be aware of. And what we really want to see is growth in those bottom lines, it's those frequent participants. That's where growth will come from if we can start to move those forwards. Small boating, very similar patterns, and again, we covered this in the webinar at the dinghy and at the dinghy show. So the cruising side, the non-competitive side, is far bigger than the competitive side. Um, but overall, the general trend line, as you can see there, is not growing. Same thing going on here with age profiles. Um, again, on the left-hand side, you've got the small boat cruising, 55 plus is growing, the other two not growing so much. Um, and even in the dinghy racing side, this is the really sad one, even the 55 pluses are not going up. So there's something happening there as well with racing. And just quickly, yacht cruising, yacht racing, again, a not dissimilar pattern, that 55 plus line generally trending upwards, the others not so. So age is significant, and then when you overlay and look at this, how is this relevant to us when we're running our clubs, this club membership profile, taken very kindly from a club on the south coast, is not dissimilar to what we're seeing in many, many clubs. And I know that some of the numbers are a bit small to read, but it's this middle band, that 20 to 30-something, mid-30s, late-30s, that are the concern. Now, this is a very real problem for this club concerned, and they're looking at ways of addressing it right now. So, the social side, and I'm going to use some of our lifestyle sports to actually explain what's happening on more of the social trends and lifestyle activities, because we're probably all aware that sports like paddleboarding are growing. But we've got things like canal boating. This was really interesting, doing the stats. Canal boating's had a lot of TV coverage and very positive coverage over recent years. And oddly enough, it's growing in every age group. It's not radical, but it is growing, up, going, growing, sorry. And one of the reasons for that is it's really easy to do. You turn up, you have a half hour training session, and you're off. Whole family, get involved, off you go. Now, water sports, on the left here, we have kayaks and canoeing, and on the right, we've got surfing and paddleboarding. Now, if you just compare back to the figures I've just shown you on some of the sailing and powerboating, this is what I call growth. This is serious growth in all age groups across all the sports. Now, wouldn't we love to have those figures for, for some of our activities? But why? What's happening here, and why? Now, in the social research that I did, a lot of trends were coming out from different reports from organizations like um, you know, Deloitte's and, and some of the bigger consulting companies. But a lot of the feedback I got from places like British Canoeing applied too. So why? Some of these activities are really quick and easy to do. They're very portable and they're very affordable. You don't necessarily need to pay a lot of money to get hold of a second-hand canoe or you can hire one. You can pack your paddleboard up into a backpack now and store it in your student room. So easy to move, and they're very accessible. Innovation has played a really big role in some of these activities. So things like sit-ons and inflatables, not just more portable, but have opened up the sport to people of all shapes and sizes. So in all seriousness, you no longer you have to squeeze into that funny little hole to get into the canoe, and you don't have to do that Eskimo roll thing. You can sit on it. So anyone can more or less do it. Things like clubhouses are not needed. You can do this stuff anywhere there's water. You can meet, you can text, you can WhatsApp people, get together and go and do it. 
So it's changing how people are participating. Hello. <laughs> um, and you can pretty much use it anywhere. And the learning side of it is, is changing too. It's very easy to see with paddleboarding or canoeing what exactly you should you do. It's a little bit harder to just jump into boats and powerboats and other things and go and do it. So people are changing. They, they want things to be easy and quick. And they also want less hassle. So they don't want things like lots of maintenance and bimbling to have to do. So this was kind of some of the stuff that comes out in the trends, but it's also actually we can see it in practice in some of the activities. Another really big consideration, now bear with me on this one, is the age of our population and what's happening here. Now this is the population census, just tipped on its side for convenience, uh, but it works whichever way up I do it. The orange line here is taking the population trend line and pushing it forwards 10 years. And my concerns here, you'll see a dip emerging where that arrow goes. That's a dip in around the sort of the late teens, early 20s. When we map those forward 10 years time, when those people are in their mid, early mid 20s, coming into the job market, bit of money in their pocket, hopefully maybe young families, there's a dip in the population. Why is that important? Because we are all competing for their time. And it's not just sailing clubs, it's every sport and activity out there, shopping, the whole lot are competing for their time. So that younger generation that we would like to fill that gap in our membership, there's less of them. Let's just jump forwards. We're going to have less um, 25 and 30 year olds. And then when we get to that, you saw that growth chart of the 50 somethings that are currently doing a lot for our industry and buying boats and they've got time and money. But what's going to happen is at the moment, the band behind them is smaller so the current 40-something, mid-40s, as they move forwards 10 years' time, there's less of them. So that pattern of expecting more people to come in in 10 years' time is a concern to the industry, especially the boat builders. Anyway, so be aware of that. It's an issue. So we're looking very much at what's happening with different generations. And you can see very clearly, if we've got the 55-something doing, doing lots, but we've got other generations, and we're talking here about what's called Generation Y. Those are people born in the middle 80s, and then Generation Z, those born around about the um, year 2000. What they're doing and how they're behaving is different. And it won't be that they'll grow up and then do exactly what we did. They don't. So what's going on with what these generations, the millennials, the Generation Z? We know, and it's in our papers all the time, there is less spending money. There is less capital around for them. So they are very li they're less likely to get on the property ladder quite so quickly as some of us, us did. They're not buying houses. They're not buying cars. In fact, 20% less are learning to drive. They don't need to. They've got things like Uber. And because of this, we're probably going to find that they're not going to go out and buy a boat and use it every weekend. Technology is making considerable changes to all of us as to how we spend our time and use our money. We expect things now. We expect to do our banking now. We expect to be able to book an aeroplane at the drop of a hat. That's what's becoming the norm, very much so. We don't expect to have to knock on the door of a club and wait for two weeks for a reply. Now, attention spans are also being changed by technology, and it's changing how people take on information, and it's changing how they want to learn. They want to learn by using things like video and YouTube and, and all sorts of other channels. So that's something we need to think about because in our industry, in, in sailing especially, in boating, we have a lot of training. It's important, we need it for safety aspects, but we've got to think about how we do that. But it's also changing how people do their own fitness. People can now stay indoors and cycle against people all over the world um, and on a screen and they can do the whole Von 2 ride um, in the front room. That's an outdoor sport gone indoors. And lifestyle is changing for these young people. They do have disposable income, but not large amounts of it. So they will spend it on experiences, and they will spend it on lifestyle. But they won't necessarily spend it on something that requires a lot of investment and commitment. OK, so whistling on, because we've got a lot to get through here. Um, Sport England did an awful lot of research into outdoor recreation and changes, and I've just alluded to some of those. But again, important, I think, for <laughs> clubs and for boating and sailing, there's a lot less interest in competition amongst younger people, just across the board. This is not just through sailing, it's across all sports. There's a huge more move towards personal challenge, personal endeavour, whether that's out on your bike, going down a ski slope, doing triathlon, swimming Lake Windermere, it's the personal challenge and adventure that's coming in there. 
I've just alluded to the training. There is a big move from formal training. My clicker seems to have stopped working. Um, we'll try this. There we go. Um, and a big move towards experiences that you can just go and do. Now, I mentioned about the kayaking. This applies to a lot of other things. The ability to just go and get out there, get started. That's slightly different, as I say, if at the moment you're trying to learn something like sailing. It's a challenge. And there's a huge move away from anything perceived to be organised sport. And in fact, for the young people, if they see and hear something described as sport, there's a chunk of them that that is a big turn-off. They don't want to know that it's a sport. But they are moving towards things that are lifestyle, environment, nature, and being with friends, being able to do things together and sharing experiences. OK, so that is a huge whistle through some of the stuff we've got to cover um, for our clubs and some of the challenges. And I think, you know, you might all be sat there going, like, oh my goodness, where do we start? But I don't think there's any one single solution. There's going to be no one silver bullet here that solves everything. It's going to be about what do we start doing and what do we perhaps try and do differently. Let's see if this works. Nope, it's given up the ghost. All right. You might need some more batteries. <coughs> OK, so thinking about your clubs and thinking about the future, one of the other things that came out of the research that I think is really important is the changes or sort of, if you like, the changes in how we approach our members. And I really want to perhaps be thinking about them as your customers. Because clearly, the 55-somethings are doing something different to the younger people already. That You can see the choice by the footfall. So they need different products and different offerings. So we've got our younger generations, to just, quick, to just quickly summarise, they're less interested in only things. You know, they are wanting these new experiences, they're wanting things now, they're wanting to do it by their phone, and they want to share stuff and do things together. We've also got a complete change in our demographic in terms of families. Because of the number of divorces, remarriages, you're seeing families that have got young children, 20-something-year-old children, parents living longer, so they've got a number of generations that they're dealing with and, and having to look after, and their time is pulling them in every which way. Now, I'm sure some people in this room can relate to that or, or see it within your own family. So your time to then go and spend doing one day doing exactly the same thing all day when someone needs to go to ballet and someone else needs to go to rugby and, and so on, it's pretty tough. It's no wonder there's a bit of a dip in that middle age group. And then we have a more active third age. This is the older people who've got time on their hands, maybe retired early, they're reasonably healthy, and there's a big move towards staying healthy, spending money on travelling, health and welfare. Great, all of this is an opportunity for us. But it does say these are very distinct groups in their own right, and how do we as clubs appeal to them? So, when I look at this again with my marketing hat on, we're not really worrying about what's happening in the sailing club next door. I think we've got to start looking over the fence, and it's what's happening out there because the competition for these people's time is coming at them from every possible direction. They spend loads of time on their devices, you know, playing games, whatever it is. That's the competition. It's not about bickering about what's happening around the harbour with other sailing clubs, which I sometimes see back at home. So, yeah, it sends out a few challenges for us. And I think, again, where we're looking, say, if I, I would do this with a client, and I think with a club and a membership, and we've done a bit of this with the RYA already, is you've got to look at your, your kind of customer base as, as a bucket and you want to make sure there's no leaks in that bucket. So it's about keeping the members that we've got and keeping them happy and keeping them for a long time, but it's about making sure that we're attractive, our bucket is attractive to new members and that when they come in, they stay. And we know from research that's been done through the Sport Development Department that the first three years of joining clubs are absolutely critical that's when you might lose people in those first three years. So how do we look after those people and keep them? And it is about adapting and adapting for the different stage and the different lifestyles that are a part of your membership. <coughs> Which brings us more back to, so what does this mean to us? And it starts to become, I believe, in sort of areas of what's the product offer that you've got available. And this is what we had to do with RYA membership, was instead of just saying, well, you can have a membership for the, the families and a membership if you're 25 and a membership if you're 14, that kind of doesn't really appeal. So we had to look at, well, the membership needs to appeal to different people in terms of what you do and what you're about. And within your club, you've got the activities that you offer, you've got the things that you do on the shore, 
and you've got your membership. And that brings out some interesting things. So that membership package, in my club, it's been the same for many years, and they are just looking at how to change it because they're beginning to recognise that they've got young people who don't necessarily want to pay a 12-month fee because they're in London. They might just be down for the summer. And it's got to be thinking about what do other organisations do? Gyms have changed a lot in the last few years. They've got rid of joining fees. They've got much more flexible memberships. Um, and there's other models out there that work. So perhaps it's about looking over the fence. Um, and perhaps it's about consider considering bringing money in, but perhaps in different ways that it's still contrib contributing to your profit, but not necessarily <coughs> coming in every month in the way they might have done in the past. On water activities. This is an area where we're going to have a webinar on, actually, in a, a month's time to talk about other, other activities. Um, but we know that things like competition and participating in, in sort of racing and stuff, not only is that dropping, but the younger people are saying they're not so interested. So what is it we can do to put on different formats, have different adventures? Maybe it's different activities. It could be swimming. We've all got water on our doorstep. There's other ways of using the water. It could be paddling. It could be other sorts of activities that, that get built in to the offer that appeal to more people within your membership and perhaps new members. And from the social side, we've all got, or a lot of us have got, these really lovely buildings at beautiful locations overlooking the water. Quite often, you'll find they're pretty empty during the week, not doing very much. Those are all assets that could work much harder for you as organisations. They could involve the local community. There could be dance classes. There could be all sorts of activities. Come to bring people in, get footfall over the door, and then who knows, that's a way of courting people to get them involved. And if you've got paddleboarding or swimming or other stuff going on, maybe that's a way of bringing them into your membership. So it's about thinking about product offer, what's right for your organisation. So this is where we're going to get a little bit into some of the, the sort of the theory part, I suppose, as, as my marketing hat comes on. Um, I can't help myself. But hopefully these will be just a couple of ideas that you can take away back to your organisation. So I'm a great believer that to bring people in as customers, you've got to be relevant and have relevant experiences and relevant things in your bucket, your, your product offer. And in marketing, we talk about something that's very easy to remember, right product, right place right time and the right price. Now that's just a great mnemonic to just take back and when you apply it, if you're discussing something new, how does this work? So just to give you a couple of examples, timing is really critical. I often hear people sort of say to me in my, in my work, we tried that but it didn't work. The weather was bad or something, they didn't turn up. It isn't necessarily that the idea was wrong, it's that the timing was wrong, or it was the wrong time for the customer. And we'll talk about that a bit more in a moment. So, I think there's things, just to give you some examples, talk about right product, let's think about our young people. Have we got enough fun stuff for young people? Or is really what we're offering them the chance to go out in a boat by themselves, when actually we know that they like doing things with friends, blow whistles at them, send them around boys, when actually we already know from the data, that perhaps formal competition is not something they're most interested at the moment. Question. Take that one away. Right place. I've just talked about assets. We've got locations. We could use them. It could be we have a coffee bar that's open to the public. It may not have to be open when you need the club for your own club stuff. And I see this in Australia where they've got clubs with a little plastic wall down the middle, public side, private side. Brilliant way of getting people in come in, enjoy the location, you make some money out of it, your bar staff can turn over the drinks quicker, get the food turnover quicker, and they make some money while they're at it. Right time. I've just alluded to this one. The race training. Don't get me wrong, race training, I know, because I've done it, is really important if you want to race. But it comes down to timing. If someone wants to have a lot of fun, and believe you me, a lot of us spend a lot of time throwing mud at each other and water at each other before we got into our, our racing. Race training is important, but when the customer wants it, that's when it should be available and offered, not necessarily forming the basis of everything and how we do it. It's really important if you want to go racing. It's not that important if you want to have fun. So timing, important. Right price. Now, pricing for some of us is probably mostly, in this area, looks at membership packages. 
that pricing thing, if it's always just been a one size fits all, you look at those different groups that we talked about earlier, the older people, the younger people, the families, maybe the pricing thing needs, needs refreshing, needs looking at. So things that you can take away, look at, but apply that, that form in on it, right product, right price, right time, um, and right place. So this next one. Some of you, I'm sure, have been in sales and marketing um, for the years. I know Katrina has, <coughs> and will recognize this. This is two business models applied to each other. If you've, any of you have been in sales, you'll most probably be familiar with the concept of a sales funnel. The idea of getting a lot of leads in, a lot of potential customers in, and as you pull them in, eventually convert some of them to become customers. They go in your bucket at the bottom. Overlaid on top of this funnel, uh, which I've borrowed from an organization I'm an affiliate of, Watertight Marketing, is a buying model uh, developed by a marketer called Philip Kotler. Now, these are the, the six stages that you go through to buy something. Now, if I'm buying a tin of beans, I go through those stages fairly quickly because I go to the shelf and go, yeah, tin of beans, thank you very much. I'm aware of Heinz in the basket. It doesn't cost me much. Very low-risk purchase if I don't like them. If I'm going to buy a boat, especially a big boat, the stages I go through here are much slower. And if I'm going to join a club or spend a lot of the family money, the stages are slower too. So the idea is that through marketing and your promotion and your product offer and your pricing, you pull people towards you through those first stages of learning about you, uh, finding out maybe through friends, maybe through Facebook, to coming along. If I'm buying a car, I'd expect to have a test drive before I buy it. I'm not going to part with all that money without having tried it. And then you get to the point where we've bought in, we quite like it, we're going home, we're still a bit unsure if our friends are going to agree that this is a good idea, so there's a really important stage here once you've bought something of that kind of reinforcing, I've made a good decision, this is going to be okay, I'm not going to sell it within the first year. So how does this apply to us in sailing clubs? What, what, what is this marketing thing all about? Well, I think it's a very, very useful model to take forwards. So we're just going to break this down into chunks. Now, in the sailing industry, and I've been in the sailing industry for many, many years. We are particularly good at this top stage of awareness and interest, of throwing absolutely everything at the customer, all the product detail, all the widgets, all the back of the BMW brochure stuff. You need to know all of this. And the person's kind of, oh my word. And they cannot see their way through. So this top level is very much about just getting, what is it you just need to understand? Sailing is good fun, probably. Serious message at the top. It's that bit bringing them in. Our club is a really friendly place to be, come on in. It's that awareness and interest, they need to hear about you, they need to read something, they don't necessarily need all the detail all at once, but you need to then make sure the detail is available. But if it's a club and you want to bring them in and bring them towards you, we need to get into that next, step, that next stage. So if I'm buying a car or I'm going on a holiday, I might check it out online, I might read some forums, I might look at TripAdvisor, I might look at some Google reviews. I might go for my test drive and book that in. What can we do to bring new members in that gives them that equivalent of the test drive? What can we offer in there? Could it, what's their opportunity, really, to try before they buy and sample without actually having to take any risk of parting any cash at that particular point, but giving you a very strong new lead? So that's the next big question. And then the last part, as I just said, we know to get them into us, come and join, they've made that commitment, they've joined, but are we going to keep them? What have we got? What's the welcome like? Is it really just the cocktail party and then that's it, off you go? Or is there a welcome pack? Is there other stuff going on there? Is there a buddy you can introduce them to sort of keep them there, make sure they're happy? And are we checking that they're happy after year one and year two? Do we know what our members feel about us, what they think about us? Now, there's tools available which the RYA team can talk to you about, including the, the, the satisfaction survey, which can help. So let me just give you an example here to work this through one more time. We're quite good in our sport at doing things like taster days, open days, push the boat out has been brilliant as a, as a project. What we're a bit less good at is the what next bit. So we spend a lot of time getting our push the boat out day and our taster day organized, and we put it on Facebook and we, we talk about it. And then we've got people coming in and they come and do the taste today. That is brilliant. Absolutely fantastic. Up till this point, this is working really nicely. But the next step here, they've come, maybe they've come into a, 
a sea school and done a, a sail, you know, taste a day on a yacht. Maybe they've come and had a go on a dinghy. That next step is, well, what do we need to do now to bring them in? It's huge for the person concerned because it probably means they've got to have a boat, join a club, pay insurance, pay for storage, buy a yacht at 300 grand. That's an enormous step. So what can we do as organisations to make these steps a bit easier and perhaps change what the offer is to do that? Because what we'll be finding is this will happen. They'll get as far as this is a really good idea, and if that step forward isn't easy, really simple, easy steps forward, you'll get the kind of, ah, oh, hang on, we've got other things we can do here. It's easier to go out on my bike. Do you see where I'm coming from? It's quite important because the higher ticket the item is, the more that hesitation is, and the more people they'll consult with in families and buying decisions, you know, the higher the ticket, you're not just going to spend the money by yourself, you're going to talk to the rest of the family first. Okay. And that big step, when I was sort of breaking it down to do this talk, there's an awful lot of hurdles. So these are my bowling balls that are coming at you. You've got things like club fees and insurance and harbour dues and goodness me, we've got to buy a boat and um, oh, we need some extra gear and we need a tow bar and um, oh, we need some clothing. And then, oh right, we need some lessons. Crikey. And then end of the year, oh crikey, we've got to refit it. That all starts to add up. And when I sat and break this down, this was a really interesting thing. I based this on my niece, who's um, in her early 30s, married to a GP in London, only just managed to buy their first house, two small people. They do come down, she did sell, her husband doesn't, but she wants him to learn. Now, if they were to buy a second-hand Laser 2000, simple starter boat, pay for the insurance, I've used fairly average figures here, the membership fees, mooring, harbour dues, whatever else to go and get, basic wetsuit boots, buoyancy aids for two. There's no change out of about £4,700. The only good bit on this list was if they buy their RYA membership for £45, <laughs> they will get considerable discounts <laughs> off those prices. So make sure you've got your joining point We're up and working because your new members will need that. No kidding me. And when I did the mass on my little laser 4000 that I own on my, at my sailing club, which I have to use eight times a year to keep it in the boat park, when I did the mass on it, because I don't often get to use it any more than eight times, trust me, it's costing me 50 pounds a sail. That's quite a lot of money when I look at it. I could hire the club boat for half the price. Okay, this is where I think we need to be thinking about for our younger generations. It's really important that we take away some of these barriers. So your challenge, we are getting there. I take a lot of inspiration from this lady when my work times get tough, because what she taught us all was we can do what we like, and we really can if you put your mind to it. So these are my sort of top 10 tips to take away. Um, I am just about getting there, uh, we are getting through this. So firstly, really understand your customer. Think about those three groups I talked about earlier. Your desired customers and your current ones. So it's about keeping who you've got, bringing in new ones. It's about perhaps looking at the products and services that you offer as a club and tailoring them to your groups. And it's about creating those easy steps forward that we've just looked at with our funnel and our, our awareness model. So just to recap, that's awareness and interest. Make yourself easy to find, make yourself relevant. Evaluation, how can they try? How can they put their toe in the water? Could they have a month's free membership just to try it? And maybe it's about some endorsement, about sort of testimonials and things, people saying, this is a really good place, come and do it. And then it's about, once they've joined, how do we keep them? How do we look after them and keep them with us on that journey? And then I think there's some really challenging things here. And this is difficult when you've got clubs and committees, but we have to be brave. It's a difficult and changing world. And what we do now this year maybe needs to change in two, three years' time. So we've got to try new things, and we've got to be brave, and we've got to say that it's okay if it fails. Now, I came from an AGM last, two weeks ago at my club where the new membership fee thing all hit, the, all the toys came out of the pram. It was, it was a disaster. Everything went wrong. But the principle of the club saying, actually, we need to reduce the fee for our 20 to 30-somethings and put it up slightly for our older members who are a bit wealthier, wasn't the problem, it was some of the detail in that and how it was put there, but it's really interesting. But what they need to understand is they've got to try it, run it two, three years. If it's not working, stop, do something else, try something else. It doesn't matter. 
And the thing about sort of digital and promotion and stuff, things can be much quicker and easier to learn and get the measures very quickly. If it's not working, don't worry. Move on. Try something else. Number nine is a big one for me. Be friendly. Now, this might sound a little bit obvious, but this is everything from language, first point of call, someone ringing up, coming to the organization, first email, signage. I'll come on to that in a moment. is a big B of mine. But the whole friendliness and that reaction of your members. And again, too often I hear the kind of people being approached, are you a member? Not necessarily the first thing you want to hear if someone's just coming in to have a look around. So it's really important, I think, taking the team on your journey. And your team are your committee and your members. They've kind of got to come with you on this journey of change so that they are helping promote your club. And some clubs I know do this brilliantly. And some I know very well don't do it quite so well because I'm a member of one of them. Um, so if you take nothing else away from this talk, you will know that this is my big bugbear, is our signage. So do go back and check your signs. Now I raised this in the reports of British Marine, and I've raised this a number of times. This sign is still on the gate. I'm assured that it's going soon, but it's had to go through numerous committees to change the sign. It's a freaking no-brainer. Honestly, really, it should say something like this, which the club next door and the next door road, a social and bowling club, has that on their gate. Please check your signs and make it friendly. So whatever else you do, aim high. This was, phrase was given to me a long time ago by my, my college lecturer um, and head of department. If you shoot for the moon, you'll end, up, if, you'll end up in the stars, even if you miss the moon. So go for it, be brave, try some new ideas. And those of you coming to our, the workshop later, um, we'll be doing some of this later on. So thank you very, very much for listening. Very quickly, when you were um, doing your trend lines with the, the younger generation going off the middle and the... Yep. Um, how much was that down to the fact that you were looking at a sort of 10, 15 year spread and actually people were, <coughs> the same people were there, they were just changing, moving age group. Um, in fact, they were now in the age group below and that you saw increases in, in the older. Yeah, it's very difficult to... So the question is, how much in the 16 years of data, how much was obviously people measured back in, I say, say back in 2002, may well have changed bracket, I think is what we're saying. It's almost impossible to, from the data to analyse that. So the surveys are basically an omnibus and focus group survey done every year by the Arkenford survey. So it's different people being picked up every year for the survey. And the sample's about 12,000 12, people that go in it. So it would be very hard to know for sure. I take the point of what you're saying, but I think really the, the point of the trend line is it shows you what's, what's happening in the sense that where we're gaining at the moment is the older groups, where we're losing definitely is the younger groups. And then when you overlay that with the population census piece that's coming, that's where I think the concern is. Does that help? Thank you. One of the worst things I've noticed of participation in helping run the club in various activities. And if, if someone's new to it, or even coming from a different district, mm. the last thing they want is to be tied down because they're busy people. Mm. And I'm sure, that's a, would you agree that's a big negative? I think it's a very important consideration, especially in the context of people where very clearly we're seeing people with shorter, not just time and money, but this sort of being pulled in every direction, that if, we, if the expectation is, yeah, you've got to come and spend lots of time doing other things on top of this, on top of that. Is that, and I suppose that goes into my question about look at your product and service offer. Is that what they want to hear? Yeah. yeah, in your customers. So perhaps there's a potential looking at that. Of course, you need volunteers and some people join because they want to. But perhaps the way around that is, OK, you haven't got time to volunteer, but put some money in the tin so that we can pay some young people to come in and do these duties. And a lot of people who are short of time We'll, your fine will be happy to do that. So it's, yeah, it's, it's kind of ch taking the problem a different way up. How can we solve the problem? Sorry, I think there was one here first. So I'll come in. Yes. Um, yeah, what we run, we run a group of schemes. So the first year, new members have to take part in the participatory hours that we run. If 
next year, they, they wish to take part, they pay a, a surcharge, but basically it goes back into the club to help run things that members don't want to do. And that seems to be running quite smoothly. Yeah. There you are. Great idea, solution to, to that problem. There was a question back here. Oop. That's a really interesting question, and, and that is covered in the Sport England um, research. And if, if you want to go and look at it, it's called Getting Active Outdoors. It's a really, really good document. Um, there is a fear of failure that's quite significant, but it's across generations as well. It's not all young people, but it has been exacerbated by things like social media. So that fear of failure, fear of looking stupid, is something to be very, very considerate of when you are, especially sort of teaching or training, Young, so young people in all generations is making them feel confident that they're not going to look silly, that you know, they are going to want to share things and stuff on, on social media. It's really important about building confidence and self-confidence because there is a big drop in self-confidence. That's a very good point. Thank you for that. Hello. It strikes me there are two conclusions <coughs> you could draw that are against what I believe that draw now. One is this thing of volunteer. Volunteer clubs are seen as being stronger and more resilient. But from what you said, actually they're potentially a lot weaker because they can't buy the services in the same way. The other is the fee structure. I'm sure every club, club here gives a, a discount to senior, seniors, old OAPs. Actually, we should be putting a certain. <laughs> It might not be, and I think this is where it comes from understanding your own club membership profile, um, because it may not be the same as the one on that chart, and understanding, yeah, where are people at? Are you gaining and losing members? And if you are, do you know who they are? Is it the older people? Is it the younger people? Is it that they're dying? Or is it that the younger families are saying, I can't afford to do this, we've got too many other things going on, so we're going to hit the pause button and do something else? So that pricing thing, I think, ties in with what's your strategy and who do you want to bring in. And certainly, I'd say that the, the example I gave of the AGM I was at um, recently was ver very much they want to target that 20 to 40-something group to bring them back because they know they've lost them and been charging them the full whack isn't working by bringing the cost down so it's affordable, amongst other things. Hopefully, it brings them back in. So that's where... I, they will get there. It's just they're not there yet. So I think, yeah, the pricing ties into... What do we need to make it appealing for our members and then how do we price it?